Good evening TCF Church family, it's uh, Wednesday the 3rd of March and welcome to our Devotions at 7 where we're continuing with the F260 reading scheme. Just a small announcement just before we we enter that, uh, just a reminder again that we have communion this Sunday at 10. This will be a Zoom communion for people to take part in, it's a live communion and there will also be a YouTube stream for those of you that don't wish to join via Zoom. And all the details of that will be provided uh, in the weekly email. Again, if you're struggling with technology, then please don't hesitate to contact us to use the emails at the end of this devotion. And we will do our very best to get you set up with technology so that we can get you coming on and uh, enjoying fellowship. The communion lasts about 30 minutes. And then we leave the Zoom open and people have a good chin wag for about 15 to 20 minutes before we then sign off and, and go on to YouTube for our teaching service. And this Sunday we're continuing our studies in the Psalms and Peter Ferguson will be going through Psalm 139. So just before we turn to God's word and we spend some time in the book of Exodus, eh, let's just pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are with us this evening. I thank you that you are a God who invites us into your presence, that you are a God who pursues relationship with us, that you are a God who has put in place a plan of redemption and you have called to us and we have responded in faith and we are part of your family and we enjoy fellowship with you and we are partakers of the divine nature that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places and we have a secure hope and a secure future and we thank you for that. Just bless our time now as we turn to your word for I ask this in the Lord's name. Amen. So tonight uh, we're going to be finishing off Exodus and essentially what's covered is chapters 32 to 40. There's a wee bit missed out in the reading scheme where there's some technical issues around about the tabernacle. But the story so far, if we we were going to go with that, the story so far is that we have, uh, Moses has been up the mountain and God has been speaking to him and giving him the Ten Commandments and giving him the instructions for the tabernacle. And down below, despite the people seeing the mountain shaking, seeing the fire, seeing or hearing the voice of God, (coughs) excuse me, they have become unsettled and they're hassling Aaron, Moses' brother, and they say they want to make a god. They want to make gods and they want to worship. And so Aaron capitulates and he tells them to bring gold. And in chapter 32, we see one of the the worst events in, in, in this nation's history, and that is the making of the golden calf. So while Moses is up the mountain speaking to the living God, receiving the covenant promises of the living God, and the people can see the smoke in the mountain, they can hear the fire, see the fire, hear the voice, yet they make this idol and they worship this idol. And the Bible tells us they are out of control. And God speaks to Moses and said, look, look what this people are doing and Moses comes down and he sees them and he sees they're out of control and he smashes the tablets and he says to Aaron what were you doing and I don't know if it's deliberate comedy but Aaron says oh oh we put all the earrings together in a fire we put all the gold and a calf came out as if a calf could come out on its own you know that you wouldn't have to shape it And so the people have entered into idolatry at the very point where God is promising covenant and steadfast love to them. And so this is a really dangerous point for the nation. And this is a really dangerous point for you and I. Because this is the nation through which the promises that we've talked about in this reading scheme are going to come. The Messiah is going to come from this nation. So if this nation abandons God, if this nation gets lost in idolatry, then the implications for for you and me and for the, the plan of salvation is significant. 
Now that doesn't mean that God is out of control in any way, shape or form. But I'm just saying this to emphasise what a crucial point this is for these people to be uh, disobeying God and sinning in this way. And so one of the things we need to deal with tonight is a tension that exists within the Bible. I, I don't know if tension is exactly the right word, but I will explain it. And that's what I want to focus on for the next five minutes. Because this tension is very important to understand, particularly for the next three or four weeks readings. Because we are going to enter a time of the Bible which is sometimes quite difficult for us with our postmodern 20th and 21st century minds to process. But what happens is the people have sinned. They have broken the covenant they had promised to God. And the tension I am talking about here is the tension of a God who is holy and that intention with a God who is loving and displays covenant loyalty. Now one of the difficulties we have sometimes is when we think about God, we try and project our emotions onto God. So when we read things like God being angry at the sin of people, at the sin of the people, we think about what we're like when we get angry. Excuse me. We think about what we get like when we're angry. And very often when we're angry, we are out of control. And our anger is very rarely justified. Occasionally it's justified, but very rarely. Whereas God's attribute of anger, if you like, is not like our anger. It's not a vengeful anger. It is an anger that is a direct response to sin because of his holiness. And so throughout the Old Testament, and then it is more fully dealt with in the New Testament with the coming of Jesus, we see this tension of a God who identifies himself as having steadfast love and covenant loyalty, but who also punishes sin. Because see, we've got this idea that love is a kind of gentle granddaddy type thing, and we're always nice to everybody. And so we think that God is similar to us. But the key thing we need to understand and submit to is God is different from us. And God can be holy and loving and angry and just and punish sin all within the context of his character, which is perfect. And when we come to some of these passages in the Bible, we also have to remember that Jesus affirmed every word of the Old Testament. He didn't give us a free pass. He didn't say, the bits that you find a wee bit uncomfortable, you can leave out. No. He affirms the Old Testament, as did the New Testament writers. And so when we come to the Bible, we are fortunate that we can look back understanding certain things because they were pointing towards Jesus and the need for Jesus and the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. But we still have to sit under and submit to what the Bible says and what the Bible says about God. Now you may be asking, why am I saying all that? And I'm saying all that because Moses comes down the mountain and he smashes the tablets and then I'm just going to take my Bible here. And in chapter 32, in verse 26, he says this. And Moses stood at the camp's entrance and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the Levites gathered around him. He told them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Every man fasten his sword to his side. Go back and forth through the camp from entrance to entrance, and each of you kill his brother, his friend, and his neighbour. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 men fell dead that day among the people. Afterwards, Moses said, Today you have been dedicated to the Lord, since each man went against his son and his brother. 
Therefore, you have brought a blessing on yourselves today. The following day, Moses said to the people, You have committed a grave sin. Now I will go up to the Lord and perhaps I will be able to atone for your sin. Now there's a couple of things about this story that's important to read and understand. Moses comes. The people are out of control. The people are worshipping a golden calf. There is debauchery. There is sin. This is an affront to the holiness of God, the God who has rescued them from Egypt. And Moses says, who is in the Lord's side? Who is on the Lord's side? And the Levites come to him, the priestly clan, the priestly tribe. And Moses says, you have to go into the camp. Now, he says, you need to be ready to kill your brother, your son, your neighbour, your friend. Now, clearly they did not go in and kill everybody. Because we are told that the number they killed is numbered as 3,000. Are about 3,000. And the scholars and people who have spent years studying this and they tie this into other parts of the Old Testament in numbers etc. That the people that were killed were the people that continued in idolatry. They were the people that had been the ringleaders if you like and were not willing to repent and so their sin was punished. And obviously the people were not wiped out because Moses then says to the people, I am going to go up the mountain and try and make atonement for you. And so when we read this, we are challenged. And I'm, I'm not going to say we shouldn't go, That's, you know, that seems a bit violent. But what we have to remember when we talk about this tension is that sin is an absolute affront to God and sin is serious and sin has consequences and sin has broken the fabric of the world and sin is causing the creation to groan and sin has brought sickness and sin has separated us from God so sin is absolute filth as far as God is concerned he cannot stand it it is a revulsion to him and he cannot be any other way because of his holiness. And the reason I say tension is because God is perfectly within his rights to have left us in our sin because we chose to rebel against him. We chose to reject him and every fibre of our being will rebel against God. And that is demonstrated by these people who have been rescued from Egypt, who have walked across the Red Sea who have heard the voice of God speaking covenant promises into their life, giving them God's law on tablets of stone. <coughs> Excuse me. And yet, they worshipped a golden calf. Because we will constantly turn towards sin. And so God in this escapade, or God at this point, is rooting out this sin of idolatry at that point. And then in 33, Moses goes up the mountain and intercedes for God. And there is a, a, a discourse between God and Moses. And Moses asks to see God's glory. And there's a beautiful picture of God saying, you cannot see me and live. Why? Because God is other. God is different from us. But I will place you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand and I will pass by you and I will proclaim my glory and my nature and my name to you. And the covenant is renewed and new stone tablets are made in Exodus 34. And then in Exodus 34, 5, we read this. The Lord came down in a cloud stood with him there and proclaimed his name, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, 
maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion and sin. Now that's the God we like, isn't it? But here's the tension. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the consequences of the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. And so we see a God who is all loving but a God who is just and a God who will punish sin. And so the covenant is renewed and Moses goes back down the mountain and the tabernacle is made. And then in chapter 40, the end of Exodus, and this is how Exodus ends, the glory of God comes down and fills the tabernacle and God is dwelling with his people again. Now there is distance, as we've talked about, there had to be the tabernacle and there's curtains and veils and altars and all sorts of things separating most holy from the holy, etc. And it's not it's not a free access, there are restrictions. But God is dwelling with his people. And so even though the people have affronted God, even though the people have committed idolatry, God renews his covenant promises again. Another set of tablets is written on. The tabernacle is completed and the glory of God comes and manifests itself to the people. And th those verses that I read to you in Exodus 34, are some of the most quoted verses in the Old Testament. The Lord, the Lord, is compassionate and slow to anger. And the bit when it says, but he will not let the guilty go unpunished, points towards a day when someone will be punished. And that person will be punished so that you and I escape the punishment. So the sin is still paid for. God's justice is still met. But at the same time, God is just and loving. And that is achieved in the punishment of our Saviour, Jesus, who takes our punishment. And so when we read these stories and we see this tension of sin and the affront of sin, the affront sin is to God. And we see... this. You know, people are being killed. That is to highlight the seriousness of sin and the need for us to understand that. And the more we understand the seriousness of sin, the more we wonder at the love of God and the sacrifice of his one and only son to remove the consequences of that sin from us and to draw us to himself and to make us a holy nation of priests to our God and to give us access to the glory and presence of God who is the God who keeps promises, covenant love, is slow to anger and is faithful. And in these stories you see again and again and again God continues to come back. He doesn't leave us. He continues to pursue this plan of redemption. And we will see over the next weeks and months that this plan of redemption is carried all the way through to the point of ultimate sacrifice. Let's pray, shall we? Father, sometimes your word is hard. Sometimes we look at it and it doesn't always make sense to us in our 2021 life but we acknowledge the seriousness of sin we acknowledge your holiness and we ask that we would never underestimate or forget the absolute cost of dealing with sin and how there was punishment and the punishment was on the non-guilty the innocent party of our Lord Jesus Christ you made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become 
the righteousness of God. Father, I thank you that you are loving and just and that you have purchased us and pardoned our sin. Help us to live for you. Help us to be sanctified for you and to reflect your glory and your truth. For we ask this in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Good night, everybody. God bless. And we'll see you on Friday where we talk a wee bit more about uh, some of the things that are happening in the F260 reading scheme and we'll be in the book of Leviticus. Good night. Thank you for joining us. To find out more about Teesside Christian Fellowship, visit tcfperth.org.uk. Together, we worship Jesus and communicate his love in all we do and say.